was what I came up with to inspire my own work. And I always, I always think that it's such a huge work. It seems so difficult. Yeah. Difficult to, to give that to someone and they're doing everyday work. You know, they're coding, for example, an IT project. And you're supposed to be the kind of inspiring girl. You're going to go up to the guy and everything. Hey, man, how's this thing coming? You're at 100%. It's, you know, I don't know if it's the plus word or what's your opinion on this? But it, it's, a, it's a very good question because I, I look back on myself, um, you know, when I started working. Uh, I, I, I am a, by trade, I am a digital design engineer. I design hybrids for vehicles. Was I the inspiring you know, guy? Or how did I get that? Or where, where did it come from? So, I mean, we're not all born to be these guys. You know, we, we, and, and at what time is it that we get this, what I said before, calling? So, you know, I certainly have no idea that I was going to be the leader of this organization when I started off work. Uh, but at, at some point, I knew I was, I liked uh, interfacing with people. I love the job where I can, uh, where I can talk to people. Um, and relationships come into play. And I think from then, it builds and it's a journey that you take. So, you know, but you're right, when you've got that, then it, it's very difficult to get up in the morning and say, oh dear, I've got this 6,700 people I have to inspire. Um, but it becomes the people around you, if they all, like Olivia, have that, um, uh, Stefan and Jane have that, that buzz, you know, and they're working in this high performance team, then basically you don't have to do much but just work with it because it's, it's moving. And it's a joy to be. So, it, but, yeah. so does it really answer or? 80% there? <laughs> That's good. And I think we were working around. Um, Mr. Hayes, uh, he's the oldest old, old student. <laughs> To company and boss, the R and D function must be easy. Can you tell us a bit more of the program and uh, oh. the, you know, the strategy that the company? This comes off like that. Uh, this is what I, I I do a lot of. So, Bosch has forty-seven thousand uh, people working in R and D. We um, give out. Uh, approximately 4,700 patents per year, which works out to be 18 pa patents per working day. Um, so it shows you the innovative strength of, of basically the um, we, we are a, a, a technical innovation company. And we, we do pride ourselves on that. In Singapore, we, we have corporate research, which is based here, um, for Haley Pacific. We also have um, innovation software, which is working on, like I said, the uh, EV system, uh, electric vehicle, uh, also banking systems, uh, telematics, uh, big data collection, a uh, smart home, which is one of the big things that we're working in Singapore, uh, EVP on. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's very large, is the relative strength of the hour. You don't have a sense of like Yes, so basically how it works is Asia Pacific is based in Singapore, then we have the Americas, um, and then China is the land of the and then there's Germany. Um, and basically um, Germany is central, but it gives then certain project products basically to be developed here. Uh, and, and one of these is, is MENS. Was it micro, micro electrical um, sensors are done basically in this region because of uh, the strength of uh, Singapore and the uh, central Thank you. Um, leaders often have to make um, difficult decisions, and as you mentioned earlier, in the booker world, the world is uh, naturally very easy. So I just wonder, in our experience. Um, are there any particular guidelines that actually help you to decide when to take a leap of faith to make these decisions, especially when you do not have all the information at your fingertips? Do you know what it is? Can you think what it might be? 
I'm guessing um, off the off the bat, I'm guessing that's your values, that for example your morals, this. your gut, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and, and one of the biggest things is you have to a little bit you have to learn to trust it. Yeah. There, there is no uh, many times people say to me, can you put it down on the paper how you made that decision or what have you? Um, and Germany, Germany. Ah, yes. <laughs> Very good, brilliant analytical people. They will analyze the lead out of a pencil. Yeah. <laughs> but um, it, it's, it's some of the uh, exactly correct. The Hades with the book of world of living, you can't do it like that. You have to um, learn it from somewhere else. And, and a lot of uh, young leaders that I have, and, and part of this coaching that we're doing, is to teach them to trust. Trust that they, you know, to make that leap, as you say, because a lot of them don't, and then go back onto the analytical, they put it down on a piece of paper, put the pros and cons, do the SWOT analysis, or whatever, I'm going to get here. Yeah. Yes. Uh, my question is a bit of a lot to this question. I understand that the motto is invented online, right? So I would imagine the company to be very innovative, creative, kind of driven company. So from a leadership, from a leader's uh, perspective, how do you ensure that there is there's creativity on every level of the company, and how do you mm -hmm. cultivate this kind of? Uh, well, if I say that our CEO um, is an ex um, R&D guy, so in charge of, of the whole company is Mr. Benner, who. Uh, was uh, basically working when I was uh, in, in software uh, doing the design. We have our own wafer fab in, in a place called Reutlingen in Germany, and he was also in there. Um, but it, it, more com it, it comes down basically to, I think, our values. Um, we have, we've started a campaign which is uh, We Are Bosch, uh, because what you get with such a big company is silos building up. Uh, and you have to go across those silos. Um, so you need to bring everybody in together, and we are Bosch enables us to do that. And part of those in there is our key value. One of our key values is innovation, creativity, um, and it's up to us as leaders to make sure that our uh, our employees, our associates, basically are allowed to do that in their organisation. But too often, I'll go into a meeting, everybody who sat there. And they, they don't say, I say, guys, I want to listen to you. You don't, you know, I want to hear from you. What are your ideas? Especially with the Gen Ys as well. Speak up, Come and talk to us. Um, and also, our CEO has um, he's doing reverse mentorship. So basically, he has a young person like you guys actually mentoring him. Um, I also have uh, young guys in my organisation that I go and sit with and have a lunch. Uh, I'll share some exchanges with you because you know, how, how do I know to work this HTC? <laughs> you guys know. So that's, that's I think, how we keep it alive. Uh, is there anybody who hasn't had a go? No. So uh, I'll come back. Yeah, thank you very much for your time and your valuable insights. I would like to come back to the leadership styles that you did transformational part because you said that Germany is like very process driven. Okay, I come from there, so it's really very transactional. So, what is the status quo? How is the culture? How is the, how is the transformational leadership established worldwide? Like it's here or there, like regionally? So, to me, it comes it comes back to a similar discussion. Uh, it comes back to the top management. So, the top management has to show and enable uh, basically transformation leadership. Uh, if they're not doing it, then how do the rest of the organization? Uh, and again, part of our, our core values is to enable that people can you know, move in that direction. So it, it's again kept within our, our values and uh, our uh, ways of working. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and we live it. So you just do it actually. Yeah. 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 But you're right, it's not something that is naturally uh, a skill that's that's uh, in a German company, uh, but I'm, uh, I'm really am amazed how we managed to actually move that on. The, the the sticking place is actually not the CEO, the, the board of management. It's it's middle management. Uh, that's where it gets a bit tricky because um, they they they're the ones who have 
who have migrated to this without the right of passage and don't know how to trust the girl. Um, you know, they're struggling with it. So that's why in, in, here in, in our region, we're actually coaching those guys to help them uh, move through that. Because uh, at times you get stuck, you know, and you need something to be able to, somebody to talk to. Well, is there a difference between being a leader of a private company and a leader of a public company? Yes. I did have a life before Bosch. I, I worked for uh, Schlumberger, uh, Schlumberger, uh, the oil oil company, um, and um, very very hard driven targets. Um, and sorry to say, but you know, I mean, on the other hand, you know, that's it. They bought the share. If they're not met, there is severe severe consequences, and also trimming of the organisation. Basically, like uh, the normal soil, um, you know, they will trim their organisation down. Whereas it's not one of it's not one of our values. So is transformational leadership possible in a public company? I believe it is. Yeah. yeah. But then you see that there's a lot of pressure on shareholders to cut costs, to trim the organisation. So how do you perform transformational leadership? Yeah, but it's the way that you actually do that. Yeah. So if you're transactional, then okay, you're out of job today. The trans transformational guy will, you know, try and inspire and move them through, give them training, um, give them other on the jobs. You know, looking very, 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 very different. Yeah. No. <laughs> thanks, thanks for the presentation. Uh, so you mentioned something about reverse mentorship. Um, yeah. Which is a, sounds like sounds like a very interesting idea. Perhaps you can elaborate and show us how how that works in an organisation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I can tell you how it would work for me. Um, as you go around your organisation and you're making you know, speeches and presentations, and stuff, you will see, I don't know whether it's some guys that stick out more than others, or whether it's just some guys where you have a relation, you know, you can bond a bit more. Um, and I saw this one lady who was working in comms. Um, and I thought, okay, I think. Yeah, I could work with her, and maybe she then can, you know, show me about, you know, a bit more digital age and what we're doing and what we need to do in terms of uh, branding, so in terms of branding that we get out, in terms of Facebook, uh, what are we correct in our activities that we're doing on Facebook? And we just meet for lunch <coughs> and basically just get talking like that, and then it, it sets up that, you know. So she'll write me a mail and say, Martin, I have this idea, or Martin, what do you think about this? And, you know, frankly, I did. Informal. But do you, do you get a uh, like, uh, type of feedback from them? Oh, yeah. That's important. That's very important. I mean, these guys are telling me. They're all over there. Now. But, you know. Um, and and what's, what's important is that you've, you've got to set your stakeholders up in an organization. So you've, you've got to, you know, I mean, with 10 countries, I need feedback coming to me on a regular basis. So where do I get that feedback? So it's absolutely important that I have these young guys around the organization who feel they can send me a mail any time or give me some, some input. But then what's very important is how to use it. Because, you know, then it's very dangerous for them, the organization, uh, if you expose them. So there's got to be a sending point. It's key. Can you coordinate like, between the different um, like uh, Bosch companies around like say Southeast Asia given that like you are you're operating as like the like the head office in Singapore? Very How do you get like the objectives of whatever you are doing done despite being so far away from China? Very difficult. I would say travel. I'm in a different country every week. Um, but um, we, we set our objectives at the, at the beginning of the year. And then uh, we have regular meetings where we review those objectives. Then. Uh, either I'm going then to the country, or some of the country heads are basically coming to me and we have a dialogue uh, about that. Um, obviously, WebEx and you know, Telco and, and all the others enable us to do that. But I still think the best is is what face to face. Uh, due to time constraint, we have time for one last question. 
Um, what are some of the challenges for Bosch? Because as you mentioned uh, that you guys are working on the marketing, right? Because right now the technology is so infused into our daily life that we don't even see it. Like for example, you mentioned like in the car, we have the ABS and the spark plugs are from Bosch, right? So is are you going to uh, work on the marketing aspect for Bosch? Um, I'll answer your marketing bit first. Um, because we supply every single OEM, original equipment manufacturer, every single car company. Um, just as an example, sorry, as an example, you know, who was the first one to uh, have the autonomous driving car that you saw? BMW. Google. Does anybody know that 60 to 70 percent of the components in that car were from? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't know that, did you? So we've always been able to build our own car, but it's not our philosophy, it's not what we're there for. Um, and one of the other things is, is, is we have to remain uh, anonymous, basically, because if we were working with Toyota on da da da, um, then Honda wouldn't use us, or GM wouldn't use us. So it's part of the, the codes of doing this. So we, you know, what we can do is more on the consumer goods um, and the, the like Rexroth and other ones. We can start to do a lot more. You know, we will do. We realise that uh, branding in Southeast Asia is not where it should be. Uh, so that's one of the things. But your first bit of question. So, <laughs> oh yeah, some of the challenges is Yeah, that's the one. And the challenges I have to say to you guys. It, it's and I, I use the term I do use the term war for talent, although that's probably but it is really is a it, it's um, so it's basically getting the right people, acquiring them in the workforce, keeping them in the workforce, and trying to move them around you know, Southeast Asia or Germany, America or what have you, uh, and, and, and maintaining that uh, that knowledge base. Because as I said, maybe two years. If you've got to shift that every two years, it's a big burden on the So we're working with our wonderful HR people and those things like this and chair. It's the workplace. Inspiring working conditions. So we're trying to work on conditions that is inspiring for the younger generation. That you do not always have to invest down. You start a lot of things like work from home, you do a lot of things like flexi hours, you don't have to come as early as 7 30, so you can come at about 9 to 9 30. Yeah? As long as you deliver your objective, and that's that. That's an environment you get in your job. Yeah, the are good. Hopefully, hopefully. One last question? I have to be honest, and that was that was uh, again a very personal one. Uh, it was uh, having to get rid of a guy or, or move him out of the company, of a guy that I brought into the company 18 years ago, um, uh, because of certain certain issues. But but those are really good. they're really good. It's not. It's not just difficult in the fact that you know this person, you've mentored him, you've brought him on, but it's then you start to question, well, where, where did I go wrong then? What have I done wrong? Uh, and to understand that you, know, you couldn't have done anything more for this guy. Um, you did enough and he had to stand by himself. Uh, so they're, they're very, very, they're the, the real, real uh, The investment and all the rest of the so are coming to The personal ones are very difficult. Thank you. Thank you.